breaking. The Taliban are reportedly preparing a bid to buy Manchester United by the Afghanistan Investment Fund, a sovereign wealth fund they set up to invest proceeds from sales of the country's vast natural resources such as copper, gold, oil, natural gas and uranium. That tweet is mercifully a joke from a satirical news page called Bazake Media, who are very funny and you should check them out. But what that tweet does, though, is accidentally highlight something that I've wanted to do a video on for a little while. Now, the best time for this video would have been before the World Cup in Qatar, but the second best time is now, so we're gonna do it. Today, I want to talk about sports washing, what it is, why some people do it, what enables the laundering of reputations through sports, and to answer a question that's been bothering me a little bit. Were people right or wrong to watch the 2022 World Cup in Qatar? Or were they right or wrong to boycott it? Or if you simply didn't care about it either way, were you in fact the most saintly person in the world entirely by accident? Also, I do want to say right now that because of my last video, which was also about a boycott, I may not have actually gotten over my writer's block, but actually changed where this was going to go from my original version. So thanks to terrible authors for being terrible and spawning okay looking action RPGs, I guess. With that out of the way, we're going to get into it. Also, I'm going to have timestamps down below since I know I lured you in with a promise of talking about a specific event. So if you want to just skip to that part, the timestamps are down below or I'll have it up here on the screen somewhere. I'm not going to be offended if you skip that, but for the rest of you, it's time to really get into it. Sports washing. What is it? First, let's define sports washing. Sports washing is the act of using sports to launder a reputation, usually one that's been damaged by wrongdoing. Let's talk about something that's always been a challenge for as long as we've been interacting with anyone. We care about what other people think of us, to some degree. It may not be a lot of people, it may not be that we want everyone to think of us the same way, but it matters to us. Now imagine you're an entity or a person whose reputation is important not just for how you're seen by people that you care about, but is important for you to make money or to be allowed to have access to certain circles, or to just to be able to exercise whatever influence you would like to have on certain places. Not to be the social media guy, but as we've got to the situation where, as I said in the video on parasociality, uh, we're in a world where any old dipshit with access to a platform could potentially reach an audience on the scale that they never could have before, things like reputation management have taken off in a big way. For those of us on social media, the main way we would like to control our reputation is through search engine results. In the case of an influencer, you would want your name or handle to appear at the top of the search, preferably without buying ads so that people find your work. It's pretty simple in that sense, but also you might, for example, have what the kids are calling a heated gamer moment. And well, if you're big enough to be making real money from it, you might want to call in some experts to help you navigate the waters. I mean, why do you think there's a genre of video called a YouTube apology, or the now infamous Twitch apology, with a crying wife or girlfriend as a prop? People haven't just naturally identified this is the best way to apologize without taking responsibility. They at least watched that Always Sunny episode. There's a step up from Twitch streamer who gets caught with tabs open, though. And even a step up from celebrities who need to not look like dickheads in order to keep getting paid. It's the realm of states and governments. Governments and states do a lot of pretty shady and fucked up stuff. Sometimes they're friends with pretty shady and fucked up states or people or organizations. You get the idea. And there are lots of ways you can try and make that palatable for people. Appeals to nationalism, playing on people's fears. Or if you're Saudi Arabia taking an advert out in The Guardian to ensure your filthy oil money is now part of the paper's income stream, making it less likely to criticise you. Despite what hacks might say, it's also worth noting on that point that 
the way that the Guardian reacted to political movements and politicians who were critical of the Saudi regime was not to support them. It's just, it's just interesting to me. In fact, Saudi Arabia ties in nicely with where we're going with this, because one of the ways in which states and individuals launder their reputations is, as we've said, sports. And it turns out Saudi Arabia's tourism authority is sponsoring, and I promise, I promise I'm not making this up, the Women's Football World Cup, which... Oh, wow, okay. I need to take a minute here. If you often watch this style of video, you might be thinking, I don't care about sports, they're boring. And I promise you I'm not going to go into the specifics too much, I'll try to keep it as focused on the sports washing as possible for you. That being said, it was very funny to see Ronaldo crying. And there's the picture of it. It is, if you're a sports fan, it is very funny. I'm sorry. Regardless of how we might feel about sports, it is culturally, economically, and given that there was a whole war known as the football war, politically important. The other thing about sports is that capitalists fucking love that shit. Seriously, if it has enough popular appeal for some kind of TV deal, it probably exists and it's probably being broadcast somewhere. Even slapping people in the face as hard as you can has ESPN-style commentary and YouTube channels dedicated to it. In fact, organised sports is so important that it shows up in the tech tree in Victoria Free, though it does require nationalism for you to get it. That might be a thing about the Olympics, I don't know, but I just wanted to bring map games into this video because I'm having a lot of fun playing them at the moment. Organised sport, having cultural clout, makes it intriguing for people who may want to manage their reputations, because as much as football clubs have been turned into financial assets, they are also community assets. If your team does well, you don't just get the sense of pride that the team you piled money into has won, you also get to go onto the field and get pictured with the trophy with a nice big smile on your face. I mean, how could you be a bad person? Champions and winners are inherently good, right? Right? Is that, is that right? Let's take a specific example of how some sports washing works in practice. If you're a football fan in England, you all have heard of Newcastle United. Newcastle United are at the time of writing this, I don't know about recording this, fifth in the Premier League, the top division in the English football pyramid. They've had their ups and downs as a club throughout history, I think that's fair to say, but what they have been is a significant brand, and for various reasons, at various times, an important cultural and community centre for the city. Newcastle became a centre for some controversy though. Think back to the parody tweet at the beginning of this video. I didn't just put it in there for a cheap laugh. Well, it was mostly for a cheap laugh. But something has been happening in football, and indeed in almost every sport that has large amounts of money involved in it. Ownership has become the subject of scrutiny. Because, as I mentioned just now, being the owner means a lot of things that could potentially enhance your reputation if your asset does well as well as the fact that specific clubs or franchises are often regarded as, as I said, important culture and community assets, even though the nature of football has changed quite rapidly in the past 30 or so years in the case of English football. Take Newcastle United again. They were previously owned by one of the worst people in the UK, and you know, if you know the UK well, you know that's a pretty steep uh, curve you have to climb. If you've heard of him, you probably think he's a bit of a dickhead, it was Mike Ashley pictured here doing something. I don't really, I don't really know what that is. Now, Mike Ashley kind of did the opposite of sports washing. His ownership of Newcastle United was a shit show. I don't think there's any other fair way to describe it. He was also the owner of Sports Direct, which for people outside the UK is a relatively low cost sporting goods chain in the UK. Sports Direct was also on the fire in the mid-2010s for abysmal working conditions, even by the standard of Britain. It was so bad that he was hauled in front of Parliament to answer questions about how badly he was treating his workers. Why do I bring this up? On the one hand, it's to show you how not to do sports washing. Mike Ashley had quite a handy asset in his possession, but his ownership of Newcastle was such an abysmal shit show. again, the only word I can think of to describe it, 
Combined with his horrible treatment of his workers, it made him an easy target for even conservative, and I've written it with a small c in my script for a reason, politicians to target him and make political capital out of publicly dragging him. Mike Ashley could either have run Newcastle United poorly or treated Sports Direct workers like shit, but he really couldn't have got away with doing both without becoming generally reviled. No one would go to bat for him, not even fans of the club, because how could you defend someone like this if you're not even getting the benefit of your club doing well out of it? This leads me on to the other reason I'm bringing this up. If the ownership of your beloved sports team was so contemptible that even the political right could score points off him to build their political reputation, how would you feel if that particular millstone was going to be removed? My guess is you'd feel pretty relieved. Now what if that millstone was going to get removed and the promise of investment, maybe not on the scale of the infamous Roman Abramovich mid-2000s making it rain with Chelsea investments, but at least a decent amount combined with what might be an at least adequate ownership strategy was made? Like what if that was available to you? My guess is you'd be pretty delighted to be rid of the disgustingly unpopular, largely incompetent, and kind of cheap dickhead who was in charge of the club and welcome whoever was coming in to take over with open arms. Here's the twist. What if the majority ownership after the takeover was going to be the Public Investment Fund, which is Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund? Because that's what happened to Newcastle. Now, you might ask me why I'm picking on Newcastle and not Chelsea, who I mentioned earlier, or Manchester City, or even my hometown club, Reading FC, and to be honest, for up to three of their owners, if we were being honest with ourselves. And it's because Newcastle fans split very publicly on the exact social media website I use, so thanks to pre-Elon Twitter for giving me this particular brainworm. This fan reaction is actually kind of a neat illustration of how ownership of a sports club as an asset works to launder reputations. Saudi Arabia is, to put it in the mildest terms, a country that gets up to a lot of fucked up things. Whether it's the issue of women's rights, working conditions, the fact that it's a leading producer of oil, or the humanitarian crisis it's unleashing onto Yemen, with a little help from British weapons, so you know, the dickhead has shown up again, I'm afraid. You might imagine, with a list of actions like that, that there's no real incentive for anyone other than people who make money from contracts with the Saudi government to defend them. Or Saudi Arabia stands. Is that a thing? I hope that's not a thing. If you know that's, whether that's a thing or not, just leave a comment and feel free to unleash that psychic damage onto me. When I say the fan base split, it wasn't quite as simple as that. There was, of course, a group of fans who thought it was morally repugnant for their beloved club to be majority owned by what is essentially the Saudi state. And there were fans who saw football and sports as basically apolitical, and that potential success that would come with investment overrode any concerns that they may have had. The thing is, football clubs aren't usually massively profitable investments, and it was an investment fund that bought them. So what did they really buy? There's a sad truth, and an even sadder follow-up. Most people have too much going on in their lives to specifically care about Saudi Arabia. Or at least that's what they're going to tell you if you confront them with the facts. Reputation management doesn't usually target groups who have made up their minds. It's not for those who took a strong moral position against the takeover, or for those who wanted the oil money to roll in so that they could win, they were not the targets, right? The target was these people who are ambivalent about the issues, and that's the kind of people you'd get see get really kind of weirdly aggressive, specifically trying to offer defenses of Saudi Arabia. This is the point to note how much of a bag fumble Mike Ashley actually committed here. If he had simply been vaguely competent in the ownership of the club, he might well have had a social media army willing to bat for him. This persuasion of the middle and the normalization that comes with your terrible actions being defended is actually pretty fucking valuable if you care about what people think about you. For example, imagine if those people were the people who make up the electorate in one of the countries selling you a shit ton of weapons. Despite football clubs being a bad financial investment generally, 
It sure looks like there might have been return on investment after all. You can also be given an opportunity to do this as a state if you're given the chance to host a major event or if your national representatives are allowed to attend tournaments and events. In the same way that you get to lift the trophy if your club wins, you or your state officials get to give out medals and hand over trophies to the winning teams if you host these events. It helps that a lot of the sporting world's governing organizations are corrupt, or at least have the appearance of deep corruption. But here's a question for you. How do we decide who's doing sports washing? What's the difference between the US hosting the World Cup in 1994 and Qatar hosting one in 2022? Or the Beijing Olympics and the Tokyo Olympics? Or the various sports teams of apartheid era South Africa and Franco Spain? It might seem obvious to some, but I wanted to really think about that a little bit in the next section. Sports washing, who's doing it? I wanted to think a little bit about who we think is doing this, and I'm sorry to do the thing that every lecturer of mine at uni told me not to do, but for my sins, I decided to look at Wikipedia, because as much as Wikipedia is, at best, a questionable source for academic work, this is a YouTube video done by a shit poster who's also a dipshit. And what I'm interested in isn't a peer-reviewed paper on sports washing, but who we, the ominous we, think is doing it and why that might be. There's some obvious ones that make the list that I think are relatively uncontroversial in terms of using hosting an event as some kind of reputation lawyering or PR to make a particular government or state look like it's not a pariah. Uh, the 1936 Summer and Winter Olympics held in Nazi Germany, pretty much accepted across the board that that is a pretty good example of this. Uh, the 1934 World Cup being hosted by Italy, at the time led by the progenitor of political and physical baldness intersecting Mussolini, pretty uncontroversial. There are other uncontroversial examples. The Rumble in the Jungle, which was hosted in Kinshasa, which at the time was Zaire, led by Mobutu, who led Zaire as essentially a kleptocracy and engaged in numerous human rights violations, while also being an anti-communist so that the West wouldn't be on his ass. Or the Europa League final being held in Azerbaijan. I think we can all understand why those would be considered sports washing by most people. Then I ran across some interesting examples, not because the reasoning was wrong, but because of what a rigorous application of this line might mean, but we'll come to that line of thought later. As a teaser, take the 2016 Olympics in Brazil. There was a wave of police violence against poor residents and protesters, and when taken with the culture of policing in Brazil, one that targets young and black people as well as other minorities, uh, yeah, I can kind of understand the logic there, but also it kind of sounds like something else and somewhere else. But again, I'm off track. Let's, let's get back to the track here. In the last section, you may have noticed something about the countries and people I mentioned offhand. Saudi Arabia. Russia via Roman Abramovich. Fuck it, even the title of this video casually mentions Qatar. Think about how extreme the examples of some of the European countries I mentioned were. I mean, it's hard to get more extreme than the Nazis and Mussolini, or take settler colonies like apartheid South Africa, or the notorious US-aligned states like Franco Spain. Think about what level those places had to get to before they made the list. And then think about what Brazil was doing before 2016. It feels a little bit off, right? Like the line moves. It's not just states themselves who engage in this through the route of hosting. I know this is going to be shocking to the British in the audience, so if you are a person of these cursed aisles, please sit down before I say this. The state can own and run industries. I know. It's crazy, right? or privately owned companies can endorse the policies of certain states. And one of the ways in which they try and get around that isn't through outright ownership so much as sponsorship of either the competitions or well-known teams. For example, Gazprom sponsored the German football club Schalke, Qatar Airways sponsored Barcelona, the various tourism authorities of many countries often sponsor competitions, not just those hosted in their own country, which is kind of obvious when you think about it. And also, I'm just looking at myself in the uh, in the recording. Wow, my hair 
is uh, is going all over the damn place right now. Let's just tidy that up a little bit. Or the notorious piece of shit Shell doing a partnership with British Cycling. These were all taken from the Wikipedia page. And again, it's interesting to see the sort of places and companies that come up. Qatar, Russia, Brunei, China, Venezuela, Azerbaijan, Rwanda, a company from Hong Kong and Shell. Now, I'm not saying there aren't issues with these places or companies. I just find the concentration on some of them curious. Why do we not consider Barclays' sponsorship of the Premier League to be under this banner? Or, to throw back for some of you in the audience, Coca-Cola's sponsorship of the Football League? Or Turkish Airlines sponsoring almost literally everything for a while? I mean, they were sponsoring all sorts of things. I get that a list can't have literally every instance of something happening in history on it. But the choice to pick some and not others as illustrative cases might make us think about this in a particular way. Also, think about what ownership we reserve criticism for. I've already mentioned Saudi Arabia and Newcastle, and Roman Abramovich's ownership of Chelsea. And while Newcastle is as of writing, again, in fifth place, I don't know if they've moved up or down, which, for those out of the loop, is actually kind of good. They may even reach the coveted top four, and probable access to the huge money that European football will bring, alongside the prize money that the Premier League gives. They're very much at the early stage of this ownership and are doing it under very different financial restrictions to, say, Chelsea. But Chelsea under Roman Abramovich was an unqualified success. The money that came in interrupted the domination of Manchester United at the time, and if we're being honest, no one aside from rival fans cared about the flood of money coming in, especially when it looked like they might get their own influx of money. I remember when my terrible disappointment of a hometown club was going to get a Russian billionaire of its own. And, well, he was the son of a paper oligarch, and again, it sounds made up, it's not. His dad was literally a paper manufacturer, among other assorted evils that come along with being a Russian oligarch. Did I, at the time, especially care when the prospect of big investment was dangled over the club I support? I'm gonna be honest with you, no, I didn't, and maybe I should've. But moving me to indifference for the sake of a brand is a demonstration of the power of simply owning these clubs and dangling the prospect of improvement. Of course I was 17 at the time when the bid was announced and seeing my beloved hometown club have the prospect of sustained top division football was probably more important than it is to me now. But whatever sports washing the son of a Russian paper magnate wanted to do, he let it slip through his fingers, the club was relegated, the incredibly popular manager of the club was sacked partway through the season, and was replaced by a generic English managerial donkey who somehow keeps getting jobs at top tier championship and mid-table Premier League clubs. Can you tell I'm still a little bitter about it all? In our quest to really think about who and how we decide who's doing this, I want to do a little thought experiment with you. Everything I say from now on will be referring to a specific event that's not on the list and that I think if you asked most people, they wouldn't consider it sports washing. But also, I want to assure you that everything I say from now on is true. And as a little side game, you can feel free to try and guess the country and the location of the event. I mean as I go through things. Two years before this place was awarded the hosting rights for this huge global event, this country was involved in what some might euphemistically describe as a foreign policy fuck-up, where depending on which estimate you use between 150,000 and a million people died during a botch intervention, justified by a complete lie. That's probably narrowed down the country quite a bit, so I'm not going to hide it too much to be honest from here on out. Let's fast forward a little bit. The two years before the event opened, this country elected a new government, and while the previous government, the ones who were awarded the rights in the first place, laid the groundwork for a lot of these things, it's worth noting that the new government pursued a series of policies that would go on to be condemned by the UN for human rights violations, particularly of disabled people. Over seven years, including the year that this event happened, the government's economic policy led to 335,000 additional deaths with these being particularly concentrated in poorer parts of the country. Now, some of these impacts were only really quantified or pointed out long after the event had taken place. And I would suggest, to be fair, that there were obvious consequences to an obviously discriminatory and frankly callous set of policies that this government proudly waved around. 
so I can almost forgive people for reserving criticism because they might have wanted specific numbers, at least at the time. There was one event that did occur before the event happened, that means we could pose the question, was this country trying to launder its reputation through hosting the event? The year before the event took place, a black man was shot by the police. This fell into a pattern in this particular country of visible minorities being what the clean term for it is, is over-policed. But the fact is that the police in this country are institutionally racist. There's, there's no, no way around that fact. This murder led to a series of protests, which then escalated into riots. Riots triggered by the policing of minorities, young people, and by some of the policies that I mentioned earlier, as well as obviously being triggered by that high-profile murder. Just to be clear, I'm not underemphasizing that because it's important. I just can't help but think back to the example of Brazil's hosting of the Olympics being considered sports washing based on the policing of minorities and young people. Now is probably the best time to reveal that I was talking about the 2012 London Olympics, which is a personal bugbear of mine because it's wildly successful as a sports washing exercise. Possibly the most successful I've encountered because to this day people will refer to that opening ceremony, which I'm sure was very magical at the time, and you can have a clip of it here. And I didn't watch it because I was 18 and watching YouTube was already a viable thing to do back then. God, I'm old. Anyway, there's probably a whole video on the 2012 Olympics and its place in the British, especially liberal British psyche, but for now, know that people really do seem to believe that 2012 was the peak of Britain in recent memory, despite all of it. All of it. Okay, so it's pretty clear that generally speaking, we seem to think that countries in the global south that are ideologically opposed to us and our allies' governments other ones who are doing this a lot of the time. But I clearly don't think that's the case, right? I think we're all at it because of course we fucking are. How could we not be? Come on, it's so obvious, right? The thing is, I lured you all in with the promise of talking about a specific event and whether you were right or wrong to watch it or not watch it, and I think it's time to finally tackle that. Were you wrong to watch? Okay. For those of you who skipped with the timestamps to get your answer to the big question, welcome back, we've missed you, well, I've missed you, but anyway. We need to take in the whole of the Qatar World Cup, as well as the press reaction to it, because it was a lot, and it wasn't helped by either the journalists covering it, FIFA's own Gianni Infantino, who we will get to in a second, or by Qatar being Qatar and it very clearly wanting to launder its reputation by hosting the World Cup. Let's start with what people were getting wrong about the World Cup before we get into Qatar itself and why it maybe shouldn't have been hosting a World Cup and why a boycott was demanded. Gianni Infantino, who I can only describe as the least controversial Italian FIFA had on staff, and yes, I know he's Swiss, but there are Swiss Italian people. It'd be funny to focus on that infamous press conference he gave where he declared all sorts of things. You know what, I'm gonna throw the clip in here because you won't believe me if I tell you. Today I feel Arab. Today I feel African. Today I feel uh, gay. Today I feel disabled. Today I feel uh, a migrant worker. That wasn't really the main clip I wanted to talk about from this press conference, at least I think it was the same press conference, because while that's an obviously clownish comment, the more clownish comment came later, and it's actually kind of interesting because under circumstances other than this one, I might agree with the content. He said in reference to Qatar's position, on LGBTQ plus rights, and on the horrible abuse of migrant workers, which we'll be more specific about later, but just trust me for now that that was the case. He said, in part, for what we Europeans have been doing around the world in the last 3,000 years, we should be apologizing for the next 3,000 years before starting to give moral lessons to people. Normally, I'm all for that. Europeans have unleashed a torrent of injustice and racism and damage and just really 
unspeakable evils onto the world, and they're still doing it. In a way, in the earlier section of the video, that was kind of my point. The thing is, while I'm sympathetic to this in the abstract, and Gianni Infantino has accidentally made a good point, which is that a lot of the patterns of exploiting migrant labor follow the same structure and have the same root cause in Europe and its various settler colonies as they do in Qatar, here's the thing. FIFA didn't award the tournament to a European country or one of its settler colonies. And FIFA took it upon itself to make sure Qatar was complying with inspections and that it would change its labor laws. It'll surprise you to know that Qatar thought it did a great job because it changed its labor laws. But also, curiously, the stories of migrant workers being subjected to indentured servitude still kept on coming. And it didn't really change the fact that FIFA awarded them the tournament knowing this was the case at the time. Qatar is not hidden behind some great invisibility shield that means no one can ever know what's going on there. Then there's the issue of LGBTQ plus people. Qatar is a country where if you are a gay man and you act on that, you could be executed by some interpretations of the law and the basis for the punishment comes from a rather strict interpretation of Sharia law that applies specifically to practicing Muslims. Now, there is no known case where execution has been the punishment for it. You would be more likely to get a heavy fine and seven years imprisonment for it. Which I think we can safely say is fucked up and bad, actually. Qatar also, obviously, does not recognize same-sex marriages, civil unions, any of that sort of thing. It also runs a program where it forcibly removes the breast tissue from trans women as part of a mandatory conversion therapy program that forces detransition onto people. Being a trans woman in particular is criminalized by its laws against impersonating a woman. And if you keep trying to exist as the person you are, you can face those same seven years in prison or death by stoning. So Qatar clearly wanted to launder its reputation. And I said one of the great things about being able to host a tournament is someone from your state gets to hand the trophy to the winner. And would you believe it, in this particular World Cup, the winner was Argentina, which means we got this scene where the Emir of Qatar put a cloak called the Bisht on Lionel Messi, possibly the greatest footballer of all time. This is where I'm going to offer a view that journalists talking about this event didn't help and got it a bit wrong. The most notable reaction was the British journalist Jane Merrick tweeting and then deleting a tweet that said, thank God he's taken that sleazy cloak off. Now this is where it gets a bit complicated because the Bisht is a traditional cloak and having someone put one on you is a sign of respect that is typically considered an honor. So describing it as a sleazy cloak when you're a British journalist is mm, troublesome. Let's say troublesome. Because, and I know this will be a shock to you all, British journalism has a huge Islamophobia problem. The other complication is that the bestowing of an honor takes on a different character when it is the literal Emir of Qatar putting it on you. Especially given everything we've talked about in this video, because look at that picture again. He's bestowing an honor on the winner. How nice. How could he be a bad guy? Especially if we don't look into anything further, right? It's all fine. It's fine. So, you know, try not to make your own stupidity the issue, is my advice, I guess. Because this absolutely was part of the sports washing grift. Make no mistake about it. But you have to criticize it in those terms, which is beyond the skill of a typical British journalist, I'm afraid, but luckily for everyone, I'm here. This leads me on to another point, which is that this World Cup took on a particular significance for people from the Middle East, Africa, and who were Muslim because Morocco did surprisingly well and got to the semi-finals. Well done, Morocco. Uh, but people got very weird about people rallying behind them as the underdog. This almost certainly mixed in with some of the criticism of Qatar and its sports washing operation, and it went to the sleazy cloak area rather than staying where it needed to be. I think we also need to discuss what's in a fan's control and what isn't, and why I may have changed my mind over the long period of writing this script. It's been a long time. Is it a football fan's fault that FIFA is notoriously an organization that's corrupt? No. I don't think it is. I don't really see what power the typical football fan has over the corruption that most likely led to Qatar being awarded the hosting rights. 
Is it also in fans' control that there's a shit ton of money sloshing around the sport? Kind of, but not really, right? Yes, fans buy tickets and merchandise and do all sorts of other things, but we're talking about the very, very top of the sports. And at the very, very top, sport fan money is less of a factor than, say, Russian billionaire money or Turkish airline sponsorship money or hypothetically gifts given by state actors. So it's mostly not the fans' fault. Maybe a little bit, but mostly not. Is it fans' fault that the World Cup is a lucrative cultural event and that the attempted boycott basically was unable to really put any high-profile pressure on either the teams to withdraw, Qatar to change its laws and treat its migrant workers properly, or really impact anything about this? I mean, aside from Joe Lysett's fake-out shredding of money to call out David Beckham, is there any significant critical action you can remember from the World Cup? That kind of is on fans, I think. By not putting our shoulder to the wheel for LGBTQ plus people and migrant workers, we'll never know whether or not an effective boycott could have taken place. Instead, we were kind of trapped in no man's land, a massively popular sporting event on one side, and the fear of missing out when there wasn't really a significant boy organized boycott that was cutting through on the other. And yes, it speaks to a culture of homophobia in football. That was obviously a factor, but to put it mildly, we might have fucked it. I recall my video on Hogwarts Legacy, and I'm glad I did the videos in this order, because that video allowed me to organize some of my thoughts on where I was going to go with this one in the final judgment. Before I did that video, my intention was to say something kind of wishy-washy, kind of middle of the road, and parts of that conclusion will remain because it wasn't completely wrong, I didn't throw the whole thing out, but I was going to be wrong if I hadn't done it in this order, and it was going to be for cowardly reasons, and I will talk about that specifically in the conclusion. Like that last video, I don't think that watching the World Cup meant that you were a homophobe or in favour of indentured servitude for migrant workers. I mean, you might be, but if you've made it this far in the video, I'm going to assume you're not those things, whether you watch the World Cup or not. The thing is that in order for me to be consistent, I have to say it was wrong. One of the lines I was going to adopt in this before I did the previous video was that by arguing, as I will later for an expansion of this lens of criticism, that we might therefore be forced into a position of never watching any sporting event ever. And what I was doing was the incredibly stupid Omni-Man meme about ethical consumption, and it shouldn't have taken me doing that last video to figure that out. And I'm a bit embarrassed because as much as I like to say I'm a stupid person, that was actually a big dropping of the ball on my part. And I don't have to tell you this, but I did. There you go. With our understanding that while it was wrong, but that you aren't necessarily the greatest villain in history, if you watched it, it's time for me to explain why I came into this script when I was writing it like a bit of a chicken and also try to wrap this up for us. Conclusions. So, there's going to be two parts to this conclusion. A higher level one and a slightly more personal one where I explain myself a little bit. Overall, I think it's safe to say that we apply this mode of criticism rather selectively, and the thing about applying it selectively is that it's made less effective. Gianni Infantino's accidentally somewhat correct points about Europeans and their hypocrisy is only really able to obfuscate criticism of Qatar, I mean such that it did, it was, it was pretty bad at doing that, because we don't look at France or the UK or I don't know Canada with this lens. I mean Canada and America will be hosting the 2026 World Cup with Mexico and I'm kind of curious as to how criticism of America's policing will compare to criticism of Brazil's policing. It's just something I'm interested in. But I think we need to expand our application of it to these countries because one, it means that we can actually understand why this is something states and rich people do and it stops us from acting as if the billionaires of the global north or the states of the global north are the default or good. I mean, there have been rumours about emerald mine Nepo baby Elon Musk buying Manchester United, which is very clearly a PR move if he does it, but also imagine how funny it's going to be when Manchester United players randomly catch fire on the pitch. It's going to be pretty funny. But we need the tools to criticise that, right? Two. Hypocrisy, while trite, is an easy way to deflect criticism, and we need to be able to criticise countries like Qatar or Saudi Arabia or Russia, as well as our own countries when we're talking about cultural assets like sport, as well as more generally, incidentally. It's a bit of a weird one for me, but I feel rather strongly about sports being important, and therefore don't want it to be a playground for the corrupt or the rich. Three. 
it gives us the tools to be more honest about things like the 2012 Olympics and what they represent. And perhaps it's a topic for another video, but the liberal and usually pro-EU lionization of the 2012 Olympics is exhausting because it shows how well it managed to obscure the events that led up to it and the aftermath. As for explaining myself, I have to admit that I may have been a little sneaky with the title of this video. I used you in the title when maybe I should have used I, because I did to my shame watch some of the World Cup. This is one of the reasons why I'm glad I did that Hogwarts Legacy video before this one, because while it wasn't anything new in terms of material, it did force me to churn through the arguments about a boycott and what it means to follow one, and sadly I didn't follow it perfectly. There are a lot of reasons why, fear of missing out, people talking about it around me, compelling narratives in a sense that a boycott wasn't changing anything, but I was wrong, and I can only apologise for that. Part of an effort to make sure I don't make that mistake again, I'm going to be a lot more attentive towards these issues than I was before. It was easy for me to say, I won't play Hogwarts Legacy, an okay looking game about an IP I don't care about. It was difficult for me to do it about the World Cup, and I failed. And upon reflection, there was no good reason or excuse to fail. So I was wrong to watch it. Now I hope that my mea culpa in long video form encourages those of you who may have watched it to reconsider whether you were right or wrong. Thanks for watching everyone. I'll see you on the next one. Right. End of the video. So I need to thank my good friend John Duncan, who provided his voice for that little introduction sequence. You should go check out his YouTube channel. It is very good. There will be, I'll, I'll use the YouTube adding mechanic down below so that you can go find John. I also need to thank my proofreaders, Mick Wright, and my partner, Mick Wright, uh, is, does media criticism and stuff like that. He's also got a new podcast coming out at some point, so I'm going to drop all of Mick's links down below as well. And I need to thank my patrons, who I actually have. I have their names here. Now, I can just edit around this bit. I don't know why I'm keeping this bit. I do need to specifically thank Drone Riff. John N, Kersley Scheider, Makusho, and SMD, they are the top tier subscribers. If you want the videos a day early, early access to the scripts, voting power on what topics I do, access to the VIP area of the Discord, the non-VIP area is available down below, it will be down there, or just, you know, to get updates on whatever I'm doing, uh, yeah, the Patreon is where you get that, and if you want a shout out, it's that top tier, that £5 top tier. But everyone, thank you for sticking with me through this video. I'm going to catch you all next time. Take it easy. See ya.